So we are back with basically my Viral Jesus co-host at this point, Karen Swallow Pryor. This is episode number three for you. Yes. So you, I was having this conversation with Esau McCauley and he's very jealous of you Oh, right now because I told him, I said, Esau, Esau's been on like two and a half times, like 2.5 because one was very short. And I said, Karen is actually my guest that I've had on the most. And he was feeling very sad about that. So right now, I just want you to know you reign. Well, you know, competing with Esau is setting the, the bar high. So I'm, I'm, I'm all in for that. <laughs> so at this point, you are my co-host. Okay. So we're just going to have a conversation and the people already know who you are. I don't even have to explain anything. Karen Swallow Pryor is back, y'all. Okay. I want to start with a post that you did on threads. How are you liking threads, by the way? I like asking people this. What do you think? I miss the old Twitter, but you know, that and five bucks will get me a cup of coffee. So I, th I think, you know, I, I, I'm the threads needs, you know, it needs to some time. I think it also took me a long time to warm up to Twitter and then that got ruined. So I, so I'm reserving judgment on threads. It's there and it's not Twitter. And so that's, you know, that's good enough for now. But in some ways, don't you, so in some ways, don't you like that it's not Twitter. In some ways, I like threads because I feel very anonymous on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do like that. I just, I just don't, I, I don't understand the reply, how it, you know, when I'm reading the th thread, I, it's just more complicated to me. So, yeah. Oh, I see. Sometimes can you not see people's replies or are you missing things? I can see it. I just, I just don't understand the codes or something like the, the little symbols or something. I don't know what they mean. So. So you just need a Threads tutorial. Probably. And then you're ready to jump in and be an apologist for Threads. We'll see. Okay. Well, here's what you threaded, Karen. You said this. What I don't know if that's a thing you threaded, but that's what that's what I said. You say this. What I believe hasn't changed. Whom I believe. Now that's a different story. How does Karen Swallow Pryor decide who she believes? Wow. You just start, you just dive right in, don't you? Okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, full disclosure, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going through that process right now of figuring it out. I think, I think, however, what I'm have learned, I, it's safe to say I have learned, um, you know, you know, we're all learning a lot these pa always, but in these past few years, you know, the foundations have kind of shifted. Um, and I think I'm learning to pay more attention to my gut and to my red to red flags I've, I've often excused things like oh that's just a cultural difference or oh that's just how they do things here um you know those sorts of excuses that you make for people and then it's like no this is not how anyone should do things <laughs> right or or so um so, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I don't think I've always, you know, I've always had the correct doctrine of not putting too much trust in human beings. Right. But I have put, you know, I have put weight and, and you know, like a lot of issues that I, you know, that maybe I haven't done the original research or read the original languages. I'm like, OK, so I trust this person's I trust this person. So therefore, I trust their interpretation and application. Um, and now I'm like, you know, if I don't trust this person anymore, then I'm not sure I trust, you know, their interpretation and application and, you know, multiply that several times over. Um, and so, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been doing that all along. And um, but this is the moment we're in now and we're all learning. And I, I'm just trusting that the Lord is going to um, let something beautiful come out on the other side for for us and for his bride. I am I am you know, almost 40 and I am, I am still learning how to trust my gut. And I do think that that's something, especially as women, like we need to talk about more. I try to talk about it more with my students because it's, it's wild how I will make excuses for people or behavior because I, I just don't want to, I don't ever want to assume the worst of anybody. So that's part of like my character and personality, but it's, in trouble, Karen. So yeah, we need to learn how to trust our guts. Right, right. You know, and, and not to not to drop a name, I don't think she'll mind, but there was a little Instagram thread that someone else started. And um, uh, Lisa Sharon Harper um, had put a comment on that thread about yeah, yeah, you know, I'm just paraphrasing, but about trusting, trusting your body, you know, like your body's signals. And I responded and I said, 
you know, that it took me so long to learn to do that. You know, so we had this little conversation. So this is like, I think, and she said, I, I think she said something like, you know, evangelicalism teaches you not to trust your body. Right. And so I'm like, hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think I, well, and it's not, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm still evangelical. So I'm always, I'm quick to defend evangelicalism, but I also just think it's like modernity, right? And enlightenment and that ration, that emphasis on the rational thinking. We, we have done a lot to neglect our bodily response, aesthetic response. Um, and it's really, it's, it's not either or, it's both and. Karen, in the end of your book, you talk about a conversation you were having with a disillusioned evangelical. As you mentioned evangelicals, I said, okay, this is my segue. You mentioned a conversation you were having with a disillusioned evangelical, and they asked you, why are you still a Christian? Can you share with us what your answer to them was? You essentially said, I don't know if I would be had I been born later in the Christian cultural landscape. What what does that mean? Talk to us about that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, they're there. I was having this conversation with some other younger friends of mine just in, in the past couple of days, because there've been so many books coming out that are sharing people's you know, either their their deconstruction or their deconversion because of the the bad experiences they had in an evangelical church, and and so um, I was observing because you know because I'm much older than you and probably all of your listeners, but I have been teaching, you know, young evangelicals in at colleges and universities for a few de- couple decades now more, and I've watched what they've gone through and. And how being raised in this, and, and and my friends were agreeing with me that this, something happened like around in the 90s, and it probably has to, a lot to do with, you know, even before the digital age, just sort of the blowing up of Christian publishing and paraphernalia, books and movies and all those things, which set before us sort of images. And there was a sort of mainstreaming of abusive cultures in an authoritarian cultures within evangelicalism. Now, I didn't grow up in those, but I watched my students come through who had, and it took me a while to see and for them to see. And I understand now why some of them, you know, they're disentangling or deconstructing or, you know, there's lots of different words you can use and different, lots of different outcomes. Um, But I, you know, I, you know, I don't know, I, I know what I'm going through now and it's, and it's rough. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I had a very strong, solid Christian foundation in my home, in my early church life that was not caught up in all this marketing and all this, you know, in these, um, programs and cultures. And so I just don't, I just don't know what would have happened, how hard it would, have, much harder it would be if I had had to disentangle it from all of that, as I see so many people, you know, a decade or more younger than me going through. Your latest book, congratulations, is called Evangelical Imagination. Can you first define the term for us, evangelical? Do you, what, what does that term even mean? And then tell us what this, where did this title come from? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I do spend a lot of time citing the sources um, among, you know, historians and theologians for what evangelical means. And so I'm not like inventing a new one. I, a lot, I know the term is very contested in recent years because it's been making headlines and so forth. But there's actually, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of history and, and scholarship on this. And and it's a movement that's 300 years old, began in England and in early America. Um, and th- that term was used, that term has been used, but it's just been used differently now. And even in the 20th century, um, it made headlines, News- Newsweek declared um, it the year of the evangelical or something like that. And so, yeah, the word kind of has been around for a long time, but often gets re-examined. And so basically the, the, the movement is defined by the centrality of scripture, um, the centrality of Christ's crucifixion, um, the centrality of the conversion experience or being born again, um, and then activism too. Evangelicals have always been activists from the time of the British abolitionist movement that saw many evangelicals fighting to abolish slavery to today's social justice movement or anti-abortion movement, like all of those things that evangelicals, including myself, are so um, passionate about is is sort of part of what we inherited from being evangelicals. And I think that's a good part, but they all, you know, can have sort of a, a dark underside too. 